Well, good evening to everyone. It is excellent to see all of you here, all these faces. I, it's been a couple of years since we've been here. I've missed all of you terribly. It is great, the fellowship, the warmth, everything that I see here. I was asked to do the Bible study this evening. Um, when, I, <clears throat> when I think about a Bible study, to me, for me anyways, I think I've told you, I've made it clear that I lay awake at night sometimes. Um, I would count those dots on the ceiling, but we've got a smooth ceiling, you know, when you have the stuccoed ceiling that there's, and I'd count stars, but I typically can't see that far without my glasses on. Nonetheless, I sit and I think, and I think about the things that I thought about God when I was a kid. I grew up in a good Catholic Italian family, and I do mean good, they, I mean, as good as people can be. <clears throat> they were very wonderful to me. I had an incredible Italian grandfather that took very, very, very good care of me, taught me the basis of the important things in life. Uh, sometime when I'm not on camera, I'll tell you some of the names he had for me, but not on camera. Uh, but nonetheless, I always knew that I was loved. But there was still the training that I received from either by default or by action. One of the things that I thought about as a child a lot was I knew that there was this God out there, that there was one incredible being or person or, you know, when I was a kid, I had no idea what it was. I could look at a bright light and think that was God. But I also was very confused by something, very, very confused. I had heard from the Sunday preacher that God was someone to be feared and you needed to leave, live in the fear of the Lord. And man, the Lord, and it wasn't even a Baptist church. So I didn't get a good Baptist upbringing. This was a Catholic church in the east side of Cleveland. It was a Catholic church, let me tell you. And it was in an Italian neighborhood. So nonetheless, uh, so I, at some point in the last year, was sit, laying around thinking about what is the fear of God? Why have all my life I wondered about this terror that I'm supposed to feel? So, as I often do, I decide to break down the words and I decide to look through the Bible and find every occurrence of these words. But a lot of times I turn to Webster's because I want to see what the current context for a word is. Why is it important in today's day and age? What happens? So Webster's defines fear. They actually have nine different definitions for fear. It's a widely used word. So the first definition is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc. Whether the threat is real or imagined, the feeling or condition of being afraid. The second definition, a specific instance of or propensity for such a feeling. An example is an abnormal fear of heights. I have that. <laughs> and we're on the fifth floor of the condo building, so when we get to walk, I walk on the inside of the, uh, of the ledge there against the wall. Number three, concern or anxiety. Solicitude, a fear for someone's safety. These are all very negative fears. Number five, and I'm going to skip number four for a reason. Number five, that which causes a feeling of being afraid. That of which a person is afraid. Cancer is a common fear. Number six, to regard with fear, to be afraid of. Number eight, skipping number seven, to experience fear in oneself. And number nine, to have fear or to be afraid. It is originally a word that, actually it's a word that originated in around, a little bit before 900 AD. All right. And there are many synonyms for it. The definition is, I couldn't believe, because usually you're lucky to get one or two different definitions for it. I couldn't believe there's apprehension, consternation, which I've never been able to use that word in a sentence yet, but maybe someday. Dismay, terror, fright, panic, horror, trepidation, fear, alarm, dread, 
all imply a painful emotion experienced when one is confronted by threatening danger or evil. Alarm implies an agitation of the feelings caused by awakening to imminent danger. It names a feeling of fright or panic. He started up in alarm. Fear and dread usually refer more to a condition or a state than to an event. Fear is often applied to an attitude towards something, which, when experienced, will cause the sensation of fright. This is a long definition, isn't it? Right? Fear of falling. Dread suggests anticipation of something, usually a particular event which, when experienced, will be disagreeable rather than frightening. She lives in dread of losing her money. The same is often true of fear when used in a negative statement. She has no fear she'll lose her money. Apprehend and dread, all very negative definitions. Right? So I grew up as a child wondering what would happen if I did something wrong because I knew I was going to be in trouble because I should fear this light in the sky. I should fear what it was that I, in my young mind, thought about whatever was going on out there, whoever this single being that I knew was important. There are additionally two other definitions, I think I, I skipped number four and number seven, of fear that I'll refer to later. The word has been around, like I said, for at least 1,100 years, so it has had lots of time to be interwoven into our basic operations, our modus operandi, our book of play, the way that we think, the way that we act as human beings. Today we associate fear with terror. 9-11 started that or certainly escalated it. Hollywood has given us the ability to enhance the meaning of fear and make it an even, an even par with terror. Fear and terror are the same thing, right? They have to be even now. Extreme heart racing shock, awe, etc. With movies like The Scream, and as a young child, I think I was probably about 11 years old, I was terrified forever by two things. One, I told you about the Italian family, but I was 10 years younger than my youngest niece, or I'm sorry, than my youngest aunt that lived in the house. So the rest of them, and there were six kids in my grandfather's family, my mother being one of them, and uh, they used to love to watch Dark Shadows with me. I don't know if any of you remember that, that series from the 60s and 70s. Dark Shadows was <laughs> not a good thing for a kid to watch. I would wake up at night terrors thinking that something was trying to come through the windows based on that, that terror that I felt. The second thing was when I got older, and I was older and much more mature, I was able to watch The Screaming Skull, if anybody has ever heard of that movie. <clears throat> also terrified the tar out of me to open a single closet in any house I entered. Right? But that's what Hollywood has done. Frankenstein, Friday the 13th, I know Frankenstein seems pretty tame compared to what we see now in the movies. Right? Friday the 13th is awful, all 36 episodes of them. The Shining, many, many others. We now have a very direct correlation in our psyche and the way that we think and the way that we anticipate things that fear must be equal to terror. So I'm a kid, even at the age of 12 or 13 when I saw the screaming skull. And I still have this thing in the back of my head that says fear of the Lord and terror must be the same thing. So I've got a, an intense fear of the Lord. The news and the TV has showed the terror of dictators like Mussolini, Mussolini, Hitler, Castro, Hussein, Pol Pot, many others to be terrified of. In the 50s, the commies were to be feared. Got to watch out for those communists. You needed to take preemptive action to make sure that they never got a foothold in your backyard. The commies were everywhere and they needed to be exposed and punished, expelled, thrown out. In the 50s and 60s, fear was used by the KKK to spread terror about how bad it would be if a black person ever got near a white person's property. Race riots ensued. 
Countless thousands were murdered on all sides because of the ignorance and fear that was spread and believed by mankind. Back then, fear and ignorance were hand in hand. They still are to this day, right? Fear and ignorance go right next to each other. But to call someone ignorant, and Webster's defines ignorant as lacking in knowledge or training, unlearned, an ignorant man is an example. Became, that became synonymous with stupid and could get you beat up pretty badly. Right? You called somebody ignorant, boy, that was an insult. You better be ready for that nose job right there, <clears throat> or a visit to the doctor the next morning usually, because it usually involves alcohol, but that's another story. An acronym I once heard for fear many, many years ago is future events aren't real. Future events aren't real. So for a long time before I knew the truth, when I heard the word fear, I felt fear, I would sort through everything that was going on and I would say future events aren't real. Future events aren't real. But I still didn't have any clue what that God thing had to do with fear and why it was associated with this terror. Yet think about how many wars have been fought over time because ignorance leads to fear. And fear leads to misinformation. And the worry that fear causes leads someone to take preemptive action to head off, quote, what might happen. And if there's one thing we know to be true about all the events of history and the way mankind has run this world in the last 6,000 years or so, it's listed in Ecclesiastes 1.9. So let's turn to Ecclesiastes 1.9. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now we've all watched the movies, right? We've seen the Ben-Hurs and we've seen all the epic movies. We've watched the, the Moses movies, we've seen the fear, we've seen all the things that go on in all the movies that we've seen over time. And we realize, and sometimes I'm amazed, I watch the History Channel a lot, and I look at, you know, the, the Romans used to have these, these things called gladiators that they would put in a ring, and when they first did it, it was everybody fighting, whoever got the loudest cheer won. But as time went on, people got more and more thirsty for blood. They wanted more out of it. So they started fighting to the death. Then they started throwing lions in there with them. So if they backed up in one direction or another, a hungry lion was going to take a chunk out of their calf. And then, boy, things were not going to go pretty from there. Right? But the one thing we know is that as that, the same as the violence back in the Roman times, what's different about that versus today? All driven by fear and mostly driven by ignorance. Some of it is just human nature. Well, a lot of it's human nature. Never mind some of it. What am I thinking? But if this is the true meaning of the word fear, why is it used in the Bible so much? And why is it so often associated with God? Why? Why is it associated with God? So that was the question that led me to read about this. And I contemplated, obviously, the last couple of minutes that I've talked, I've gone through history, I've watched the History Channel 1, now there's a History 2. I'm pretty happy <clears throat> in the evenings after my wife falls asleep, I can flip through the two channels and find something really interesting to watch about what we've done over time. But I, can't, I have never been able to put that together. So what I did in sitting there in front of the computer, I did a search on a word called fear of the Lord. And I would encourage you to sharpen your pencils. Kind of, I'm, I'm going to give you references to that exact phrase. The exact phrase, fear of the Lord, occurs 30 times in the Bible, 29 times in the Old Testament, 14 times in Proverbs, and 7 times in Isaiah, and but once in the New Testament, just once, fear of the Lord. 
The word fear is in there quite a bit, but the phrase fear of the Lord is in there 30 times. So let's look at the first occurrence and let's see if we can define what fear of the Lord is so that we no longer have this terror associated with fear of the Lord. Let's look at the first occurrence. It's 1 Samuel 11, starting in verse 1. And I'm going to go through verse, I think it's 7, maybe more. So I'm going to go 1 Samuel, yep, through 7. So 1 Samuel 11, verse 1. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jebesh Gilead. I practiced that a hundred times before I, before I got here. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nabash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition I will, make, will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes, and lay it for reproach upon all Israel. Now I can imagine him standing there. <laughs> I have no idea what the man was like, but I can imagine a man standing there laughing with that hearty Hollywood laugh, for lack of a better term, right? And saying, ha, ha, ha. All right, here's the condition, All right? So let's continue in verse 3. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. So let us go check with everybody and see if there might be somebody that could save us. And then we'll come back and let you know. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, Why aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was king kindled greatly. Now, I'm pretty sure that wasn't the anger that says, I can't believe you just cut me off in traffic because it came from God, but I'm sure it was true righteous anger. I'm sure he couldn't believe that the great nation that he was a part of couldn't come up with some way to deal with this. So let's look, verse 7, it says, And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces. He was pretty angry. Oxen are not small. I learned that because I was just watching something about the National Geographic channel, or on the National Geographic channel. They were talking about oxen, and they were talking about bison, and they were talking about all the, these are huge animals. So he cut them to pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. Youch! That's going to be painful. Not for the oxen, but for the people that own them. And with the fear of the Lord fell on the people. And they came out with one consent. Now, with one consent under the fear of the Lord. That's the first occurrence of the fear of the Lord, that phrase in the Bible. What emotions does that stir up in you? Whew, I better not mess with this God. He'll cut me to pieces. Terror? Now let's look at why this type of fear is based in other words in the, uh, this type of fear is based in another word that drives people. I said it earlier. It's the, it's the, co, the cohort with fear. It's ignorance. Earlier, I told you that there were two additional definitions for fear, according to Webster's Dictionary. Number four is reverential awe, especially towards God. Number seven is to have reverential awe of. Now, I started pouring through the Bible. I wanted to read all 30 verses with reverential awe instead of fear of the Lord. I wanted to see if it changed 
the mood from negative, which I grew up with, which I was trained with, which the world around me understands. I wanted to see if it changed the way that I felt about how I felt about the fear of God. And lo and behold, let's read it. Let's read verse 7 again with reverential awe in it instead. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the reverential awe of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. The reverential awe. Now what is reverential awe? What is that? Well, I've had four children now. I still have one that has a lot of reverential awe. I don't understand how this happened, but there were a number of years ago at the Feast of Tabernacles that she took to this, uh, this David Smith guy. And she just thinks he is the coolest thing since sliced bread. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but she has awe for him. He is always kind. He speaks to her. He speaks to her as the person of her age without being disrespectful, young, younger or older. So she has awe for him. Children have reverential awe for things around them. We are told to be like children. So reverential awe of the Lord is also fear of the Lord. That reverential awe comes through. So when I read that, what were your emotions with the word reverential awe instead of fear of the Lord? Did it change the way it felt about it? I gotta tell you, here's what it did for me. Oh, that is so cool. God could kick the tar out of the Ammonites. That's the first thing that came to mind. And yes, it was the word tar, right? Remember, I've been talking about your core. I've been talking about being in the positive versus the negative. What are the thing, the negative feelings in fear of the Lord and reverential awe? Now, I'm not meaning to change the words of the Bible. I'm not re meaning to rewrite them. What I'm trying to do is give you a reference that lets you have a different feeling about the God that you worship, the God that you love, the God that you desire to be a part of his kingdom. Reverential awe. So we look at that in the light and not the darkness. Reverential awe allows us to look at what God does, even in the Old Testament, even in amongst all the things that were going on. And it allows you to look at it in the light and not in the darkness. Let's look at some other scriptures. I told you to get your pencils sharpened. Here we go. It's a scripture run, but there's a ton of them out here, and it makes a huge difference. Let's take a look at some other scriptures. We'll see how this understanding emotionally changes and f changes the, feeling, the, the whole meaning of the scripture for the positive just because of our base of reference. Not because it changes the scriptures, but just because of all the things we have going around us. Right? The things I described up front, the things some of us have experienced, in the, in the age that we've lived, the things that, that we understand based on the, ref, the context of our lives and all the things that we've experienced in, lives, in our lives. The first one is Second Corinthians, or I'm sorry, Second Chronicles 14.14. 14. I'm not going to go there, right? but you need to write that one down and it'll give you a, a good, good walk through there. The second one is Second, Corinth, or sorry, Second Chronicles 17, verse 10, and I am going to go there. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were around about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. So the people around Jehoshaphat had reverent awe of the Lord that was over and round about Judah. They had reverent awe. Now maybe some of them were terrified. Maybe they were ignorant. Maybe they didn't understand. But they, I'm sure they had seen some of the signs. I'm sure they'd seen some of the things that went on. I'm sure they knew the power of Judah, of the armies of Judah. I, knew, I know that was true. But they had referential awe for that God. How many times in the, in the Bible do you read that people, people see what God can do and they go, oh, I want nothing of that. I'm going to go this way. 
and let them go wherever they want. What kind of fear is this? Is this terror? What does terror lead men to do? They embrace their ignorance. They rise up against what they are ignorant of. If they do not have a clear understanding of the awesome power and therefore reverent awe of the God of Israel, they, will have, they will, would have tried to make war with Jehoshaphat, but they didn't. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 7. In this scripture, God does not take bribes. He has no respect for persons, just for what is right. I'm going to go through these quickly, so I hear the pages turning. It's, I'll tell you when I'm going, to, I'm going to go to one that we need to turn to. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 9. All right. Now, we start to understand what happens when we are truly in reverent awe of the Almighty God. When you start reading those scriptures and using fear of the Lord, using reverent awe. So Job 28, 28, and we are going to turn there. So Job 28, 28, and I'm going from beginning to end in these. And unto man he said, Behold the reverent awe of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to, depart, and to depart from evil is understanding. What's the opposite of understanding? Ignorance. So reverent awe of God, reverent awe of the Lord, that's wisdom. And to depart from evil, to walk away from evil, is a lack of ignorance. It's an understanding. Psalm 19, verse 9. We'll turn to that one. I love the Psalms. Psalm 19, verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So the reverent awe of the Lord is clean. Right. Psalms 34, verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you a fear of the Lord. There's the reference to children. And if you replace that with reverent awe, you see that it says, Come, children, hearken unto me. Come to me. I will teach you the reverent awe of the Lord. It is not about fear. It is about respect. It is the ultimate respect to know that the Lord will absolutely do everything that he sets out to do whether he does it with you or without. It is all about having reverent awe of him and doing the things that he asks. Psalm 111, verse 10. I'm going to go there. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord, again, the reverent awe, is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So the reverent awe is what's required for the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all they who do the Ten Commandments. His commandments. Proverbs 1, verse 7. Proverbs 1, verse 7. I'm going to turn there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of knowledge. The reverent awe of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I said earlier that humility was one of the two basic components of what we need as human beings in order to make sure that we keep close to God. Well here it says the reverent awe is the beginning of knowledge. Can you be awful? It can be awful. Listen to me. Can you be in awe of something else if you're full of yourself? You must be humble. So the reverent awe of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, verse 29. Again, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the reverent awe of the Lord. They hated knowledge and did not choose that fear of the Lord. 
Proverbs 2, 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Do you see a pattern here? Everywhere it says fear of the Lord, there are very, very clear instructions. If you look at it with, from the standpoint of reverent awe, there's very clear, inst well, there are clear instructions anyways because our minds are open to it. But this makes, this turns it for our minds in this day and age into a positive item. It turns it into, the, if then thou shalt understand the reverent awe of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the reverent awe of the Lord. Right? All of those make perfect sense. I went to Proverbs 2, 5 without telling you, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. I have a lot of scriptures here. Actually, I think there's only about 15 left, so we're halfway there. Proverbs 8, 13, I won't turn there, but you might want to mark it. There is incredible comfort in reading these with the word reverent awe in that place. There's incredible comfort. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9.10. Proverbs 9.10. Remember I said there were quite a few of these in Proverbs. The fear of the law of the Lord, or the reverent awe of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 10.27. The fear of the Lord, the reverent awe, prolongeth days. Ooh. Did you hear that? The reverent awe of the Lord prolongeth days. Now, why do you think that's true? Why do you think that's true? If you have the reverent awe of the Lord, whose statutes do you walk in? What are you striving to do? What do you want to do with your life? What changes do you want to commit to? Do you stop eating pork? Because God didn't put that there just to be you know, angry at the pig farmers. He put that law there because he knew what our bodies needed. If we walk in the reverent awe of the Lord and his statutes, we are in with, with exactly what he says and our days will be prolonged. But the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Now I know, I know sometimes it seems like that neighbor is going to live forever, right? I'm not going to mention any names. But that neighbor is going to live forever. But we have to realize that our days will live on. One of the things that I thought of when I was reading this scripture, and I, you know, I turned all of these around in my head, was that Herbert W. Armstrong revived a work. Garner Ted Armstrong continued that work. And all of us, in one way, shape, or form, heard some portion, be it secondhand, be it through another minister, be it on, it doesn't matter how, but somehow we heard that information. And we are here today because we have reverent awe for the words that we heard. We understand that this is the true and the, tr the truth and the true way of life, and that we know that if we live in this truth, our days will be prolonged. Proverbs 14:26. Proverbs 14:26 says, "In the fear of the Lord, again, the reverent awe, is strong confidence." Think about all the men of the Bible. Think about David that walked up. Young David that walked up, that slingshot, in his hand, and took that Goliath down. I don't recognize any place in any of those readings where he had any fear. Not the kind that we experience, right, that we've known, we've been trained to. I don't hear any of that. He didn't walk up there with terror. He knew who God was. He knew who the God of Israel was, and he walked up and did it. Good for him. One of my favorite stories as a kid, right? Because I kept thinking, again, that was one of those, those conflicts. Wow, I got to be like him because, look, he had no fear. And I know we're supposed to have this fear of the Lord, but look what he did. Look at how far he got. I hear all these great stories, and 
I'm, I'm going to say this in a sermon again, or in a, in a Bible study, in Sunday school. Anybody remember the first time I ever gave a sermon at the feast? And I said, I really want to thank the ladies that are conducting the Sunday school. Here, that's it. The slip up, and I had probably two dozen people come up and tell me, "Do you realize after that what you said?" Anyways, so that's the second time I've, I've said Sunday school when I went up here. Um, it's strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Ah, there's that word again: children. Reverent awe and children goes hand in hand. Right? Sometimes children are afraid of people. Sometimes they have instincts that we just trust, right? We know. And sometimes their instincts say that there's somebody that they really like to be around, right? That's reverent awe. We need to be like those children. His children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 14, 27, again, not too far to turn there. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. To keep you away from death, you need to have a good, healthy, reverent awe of the Lord your God. Proverbs 15, 16, I won't turn to, but you can mark it down. Proverbs 15, 33, I will turn to. Proverbs 15, verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. There's that humble thing again. Right? I think we need to keep that in mind. Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the law, uh, fear of the Lord, that's twice I've done that, the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Again, by the reverent awe of the Lord, men depart from evil. If you have respect for the God that called you out of this world, you will depart from evil because you will study his words, you will understand his ways, you will know more and more, and you will get more of that within you. Now, I'm going to break here a little bit off track. I have been reading a fascinating book, and I've been reading it now for about five months. I took a new job uh, about 45 days ago, and I don't travel anymore. So uh, I think at this point my wife is wondering when I'm going to go out of town again. Maybe not, but, um, but I don't travel anymore. So I'm at home uh, all the time. So it's been tough to read because I used to read when I'd get on the airplane, you had that 45 minutes until you could get up high enough to turn your computer on. And then you got that 45 minutes on the way down. So you've got about an hour and a half to read on the plane. And I used to uh, go through this book and I read very slowly. So I've been reading this book for a long time. But it talks about how our minds are programmed. They have discovered amazing things about the human brain in the last 10 years. Absolutely amazing things. You are pre-wired. You are pre-wired to accept the truth of God. Now, they don't say that, but you are, I will tell you that you're pre-wired. It doesn't mean that your human nature doesn't fight it tooth and nail, but physically you are wired. You are a collection in the frontal part of your body, which is where the, the Holy Spirit resides, the frontal part of your brain. You are a collection of all of the emotions that you've had in your life, the references. Remember I talked earlier about the references, fear of God and all the, the Hollywood and all the things you grew up and the things that go on in the world around you? In your frontal lobe, in which man has the largest set of frontal lobes in any mammal on the earth, any animal on the earth. It's by, by and by, it's times bigger than any other animal. That is where you store all of your reference to all of your emotional experiences in life. Now what happens when you're in a situation, you're driving, doesn't matter what you are, where you are, as you go through life and you collect these experiences in that part of your brain, which is incidentally, and I will say this a dozen times, where the Holy Spirit resides, in the frontal lobes of your brain, right? you fire off specific cells called dopamine cells. I'm not going to go into a big, big explanation of it. Well, maybe I will. Who knows? I get, I get that way sometimes. I get a little overexcited. 
But you have these things called dopamine uh, that, that gets fired off. It connects one cell to another. From the frontal lobe, the reference of your body, into the back parts of your brain, into the central area of your brain that has specific types of curly nerves that accept those and broadcast them throughout the parts of your body. That's how you get adrenaline. So if you see something that you recognize as fear from before, instantaneously you have adrenaline. Now I find it very coincidental, and I, and I really don't find it coincidental, God chose to impart the Holy Spirit when you accept baptism where? In your left toe? In your right little finger? No, into the frontal lobes of your brain. He put that part of your, that part of the Holy Spirit, that beginning of the Holy Spirit in the frontal lobes of your brain. So if you nurture it, you are going to have reference that will fire off specific cells in your body to recognize godly things, things that are true, things you've learned from the Bible. It is truly amazing the way the human brain is wired. Now there's much more to it. It's, a, it's an incredible book. I'll give you the title if you want it. It is not a light read. It's only a few hundred pages, but this guy and this guy believes in a, a lot in evolution. So I find it very amazing that God knew exactly what he was doing. I actually don't find it amazing, but I find it confirming. So reverential awe of the Lord is experienced in the frontal lobes of your brain because awe is an emotional response. When you are in awe of a sunset, when you're in awe of the rainbow that we saw yesterday, when you're in awe of those things, there's an emotional response. Your body feels a specific way. If we teach ourselves and train ourselves repetitively the same way that we got all those things through the news and all those things through Hollywood, right? We take that programming out, we reprogram ourselves to the pages of our Bible. We are programmed to do it the right way. Now we fight it tooth and nail. That's human nature. The carnal mind is, is against God, right? We fight it. But if we want to be and we train ourselves more and more, that's why study is important. That's why Bible studies are important. So, a little sidetrack, but it does say the way that your brain is wired. You're actually pre-wired to accept that and do the right things. You just fight it tooth and nail. Right? What did Paul say? Right? What I want to do, I don't do. Right? He made it very clear. Well, I'm going to continue. I'm not quite sure where I left off. Let's go with Proverbs 15:33. Oh, I did that one. Let's go with Proverbs 16, verse 6. Proverbs 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So by reverent awe of the Lord, and his works, and his words, and reprogramming our minds, we depart from evil. Now there's Proverbs 19:23. And 22.4, neither of those I'll turn to right now, but you might want to walk, mark them down. I've got to tell you, a couple of times since I did this study, I've walked through these scriptures and just read them with the word reverent on them. And I felt better. I felt closer. Proverbs 23, verse 17. I brought this one out for a reason. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all day long. So, it doesn't say just be in reverent awe of God when you're at services. It says be in reverent awe of God all day long. David, even though he went back and forth at times to different extremes, David was in reverent awe of the Lord all along. And he was a man beloved of God. Isaiah 2, 10, 19, and 21, all three contain the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 2, I'm going to turn there. And the Spirit of the Lord, and Isaiah 11, 2, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the reverent awe of the Lord. Isaiah 11:3, and shall make him 
of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. So you quickly understand if you have awe for the Lord your God. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Isaiah 33, verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Are our times stable? Are we, are, is the world have wisdom and knowledge? They have knowledge, but what kind of knowledge do they have? The stability of thy times and strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, reverent awe, is his treasure. And finally, the only occurrence of the phrase in the New Testament, the only occurrence of this phrase in the entire New Testament, is when Saul has joined with the apostles and once the other apostles finally believed his conversion, we all knew who Saul was, and what did they live in in their ignorance? Right? They were not aware when Saul walked through the door. Right? Can you imagine what that room full of apostles felt when they saw him? Can you imagine that? That's the things I talk about in the first part. Right? The negative emotions, the first thing they thought. Did they think that perhaps God could make this kind of change in a man? Did they think that or were they terrified? Right? Their first reaction was to look at him and say, whoa, 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 not him. <laughs> not that one, uh-uh. I don't want him in here. So let's turn to Acts 9, verse 28. I did not even look at what time I started, Mr. Trent, so if you can at some point let me know if I'm getting close. Acts 9, verse 28. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, I believe that I separated this out. No, I did not. Okay. Acts 9.31, I think this is either New King James or King James Version, says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, lifted up, and walking in the fear of the Lord, again, the reverent awe of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost in this case, were multiplied. Now, I also put this in here. There's a, a version of the Bible that I read all the time. It's called the Bible in Basic English. Um, and it is fairly accurate. It's got uh, its interesting twists. We have to be careful to discern all of those. But in the Bible in Basic English, Acts 9.31 says, And so the church through all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was made strong. And living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, was increased greatly. So they lived in the reverent awe of the Lord, right? Not the fear, not the terror of the Lord, not that negative feeling, but the fear of the Lord, true fear of the Lord. True fear is not terror. It is reverent awe, it's respect, and it's exactly, exactly, it's what we want our children to have to us. We want them to respect us. It's what we want people to know, right? It is exactly what needs to happen. We need to have reverent awe for God. Need to have that. I encourage you, brethren, live as a child. Live as a child looking at a bright, shiny object, something that's warm, right? Bright, shiny, and warm. Wanting to touch it. Wanting to go poke at it just to see what it is, right? What is that? Not that I ever did that, but I'm really good at this for a reason. <clears throat> Let your curiosity stand in reverent awe. Let it stand in reverent awe of your God, the one that you accepted, the God that you know has called you out and into his truth, and live in this type of fear, which is not terror, 
which is not uncomfortable, which is not unexpected, which does not take the frontal lobes of your mind and fire off neurons inside you that make you clench, that make you get ready for the fight, that make you want to run. We are not fleeing from a terrorizing God. We are in reverent awe of someone that can do anything, absolutely anything. He can tell people to march around a set of walls seven times, make a lot of noise, and the walls fall down. He can bring us to eternal life if we have awe of him. So let's get closer. Let your curiosity stand in that reverent awe of your God. Let that type of quote-unquote fear of him lift you up and edify you so that you may inherit the riches that he has in store for you. Really, when it comes down to it, while there are a lot of great lessons in the Bible, there are some very basic tenets that we can be taught by children. There are very basic, basic things that we can be taught. We have learned in our ignorance to be complicated. We have learned, and some of it is just because the way the world works, we have to operate in it. But we've learned all those things. But that reverent awe, which comes from a humble heart, which comes from a contrite spirit, can only be with you, or only be good for you, for your salvation. Again, I encourage you to have that type of fear of him so that you may inherit those riches he has in store for you.